Welcome to Once Saved. This is a channel dedicated to the supremacy and all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ, who can set us free from sin and see us through any trial we face. In this video, I'll be talking about the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I'm going to give you three irrefutable proofs from Scripture that the church will be raptured and resurrected before the end times tribulation starts. There are a lot of videos out there on the rapture, and there are several different positions that Christians hold on when the rapture will occur. One of the weaknesses of most of those arguments is that they often try to prove whichever position they hold on the rapture by using verses that can be interpreted multiple ways or have undefined terms that can mean any number of things, terms such as the last trumpet or the last day. When this happens, a pre-trib person and a post-trib person, for example, can look at the very same verse and interpret it differently to fit their view of the rapture. So to avoid confusion, I want to focus on just three passages of scripture that provide not just proof, but irrefutable proof that cannot be argued, cannot be ignored, that the rapture must occur before the tribulation starts, end of argument. The rapture of the church won't happen mid-trib or pre-wrath or post-trib. The church will be raptured pre-trib. Three irrefutable proofs of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That sounds like a tough challenge. Let's get into it. First, why is it important what you believe about the rapture? After all, your view on the rapture does not affect your salvation. Salvation depends on only one thing, believing on Christ to save you, believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for all of your sins and that he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. Faith in Christ is the only thing that matters for salvation. So what does it matter what you believe about the rapture? Let me give you three reasons. First, faith in God's promise of a rapture purifies us. The Apostle John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This last phrase, even as he is pure, means that in God's sight, we are already pure because of Christ. We're not pure because we obey and keep his commandments. We're pure because Christ is pure, and he imputed to us his righteousness, his purity, the moment we believed in him. But that purity ought to be seen in our daily practice, the way we live our lives. We need to live pure even as we already are pure. And John wrote that having that imminent hope of Christ's return in you helps you to maintain that focus of purity in your life, even as you already are pure in God's sight. So having an imminent view of the rapture helps purify us. Secondly, faith in God's promise of a rapture comforts us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul wrote about our being raptured to be with the Lord. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. As we see this world getting worse and worse, moving close to that great tribulation period, God wants his people to not be afraid that they will have to go through those horrible judgments. We can take comfort in the promise of God that he will rescue us before those end time tribulation and destructive judgments come. We already have tribulation in this world. Jesus told us to expect that, but that is nothing compared to the destructions and terror that will fall on this world during the tribulation. To that, God's word says we are to comfort one another with his promise of a rapture that will spare us from what is coming. Third, faith in God's promise of a rapture helps us to stay ready. John also wrote in 1 John chapter 2, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. No Christian wants to be ashamed before Christ when he comes. Maintaining a strong focus that Jesus could come for his bride in the rapture at any moment helps us to stay ready. It's like expecting that an important guest will be coming to your house. 
If you know your guest won't show up for another week, you won't really care how messy your house is today. After all, you've got another week until he arrives, and so you won't worry about cleaning up the place until the time gets closer. But if you think your guest could show up at any moment, you will be much more determined to be ready now to make sure everything in your house is in order. So it is with the coming of Christ in the rapture. Maintaining that view that Christ could show up at any moment helps us to stay ready so that we're not ashamed in his presence. The goal for all of us should be to end well, to finish the race so that we bring glory to God. And that includes having a focus on Christ's return that can happen at any moment. Okay, enough preaching. Let's get on to teaching where I'll show you why the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is the only view taught in scripture. Here's the outline for this video. First, we'll look at a short introduction to the rapture, including where it is revealed in scripture and the various positions on when it will occur. Second, we'll look at three irrefutable proofs of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, showing that the church must be raptured before the seven-year tribulation starts. Third, we'll look at consideration of four arguments against the pre-tribulation rapture position. These are arguments typically raised by post-trib supporters against the pre-trib position. I'll show you how these key arguments not only fail to disprove pre-trib, but how they actually support pre-trib. And then fourth, we'll look at the story of Noah, a picture of pre-tribulation rapture. I wanted to include this because nearly all pre-trib supporters that I've seen who say that Noah is a foreshadowing of a pre-trib rapture do a terrible job of proving their case because they get the symbolism wrong. I'll show you exactly how the story of Noah is a foreshadowing of the pre-tribulation rapture. So let's get going, starting with topic number one, a short introduction to the rapture. The word rapture is not in the English Bible. It comes from the Latin translation. The actual Greek word used in the Bible is the word harpazo, which means to be caught up or carried away by force, to be seized, to be snatched out of the way. It is a violent and fast taking away of something. The rapture is described by Paul as a mystery, which means it is something that has never before been revealed, which means Jesus never taught about the rapture, or it wouldn't be a mystery years later when Paul wrote about it. How could Paul call the rapture of the church a mystery if Jesus taught about it in Matthew 24, for example? The answer is Jesus didn't teach about the rapture of the church in Matthew 24. We'll look at that. The rapture describes a split-second moment in time when believers will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and will be instantly transformed from having mortal bodies to immortal bodies. There are two main passages of Scripture describing the rapture. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul wrote, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In this passage, described as a mystery that has never before been revealed, we see the reason and necessity for the rapture, namely because our flesh and blood bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We must be given eternal bodies, spiritual bodies. That transformation from mortal to immortal will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We also see in this passage a reference to when the rapture will occur. It will occur at the last trump. A trump is a trumpet or the sound of a trumpet. It may be the blowing of an actual trumpet, or it could simply be the voice of God, which scripture says sounds like a trumpet, the trump of God. I mentioned earlier how people use undefined terms to try and prove the timing of the rapture, and this is one of them. Which blowing of the trumpet is the last trump that precedes the rapture? 
Such undefined terms can be interpreted multiple ways. For example, most post-trib supporters say that the last trump is the seventh and final trumpet in the book of Revelation. The problem is, in Matthew 24, after Christ returns to earth, we see another trumpet being blown. Which one is truly the last trump, if either of these? For pre-trib supporters, the last trump can simply mean the last trumpet that is blown to end the church age, which could happen at any time. So the phrase, the last trump, is undefined and can be argued either way. Relying on such undefined terms doesn't solve it or prove anything. It's just someone's opinion as to what that term means. As a result, we see a lot of arguing back and forth between supporters of various views of the rapture. That's why in this video, I want to show you irrefutable proofs of a pre-trib rapture that do not depend on undefined terms. Paul goes on, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When God calls us up in the rapture, we will immediately be given our eternal bodies. Our corruptible flesh will put on incorruption, our mortal bodies will put on immortality, and death will finally be defeated. The second main passage on the rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15-18. through 18. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here we see that there will be an order to the rapture. The dead in Christ, those who have already died having believed in Christ, will be raptured first. Then those who are still alive will be caught up with them. There's that Greek word harpazo, to meet the Lord. We also see the place where we will meet the Lord. It's not going to be in heaven or on earth, but in the air, after which we will be with the Lord forever. Paul concludes by saying we are to comfort one another with these words. We can take comfort in the fact that God's not going to leave us here on earth. He's going to bring us up to be with him in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the rapture, where we'll be given eternal bodies and live with the Lord forever. Now comes the big question, when will the rapture of the church occur? This question has been debated for 2,000 years, which really should not have been the case because scripture gives us irrefutable proof as to when the rapture will occur. We're not told the exact day, but we are told the timing of when the rapture will happen relative to the tribulation events and the second coming of Christ. There are four main views on the timing of the rapture of the church. First is the pre-tribulation view that the church will be raptured before the start of the final seven-year tribulation on earth. Then there's the post-tribulation view where the church will go through the entire seven-year tribulation on earth and be raptured at the second coming of Christ. Third, we have the mid-tribulation view, where the church will be on earth through the first three and a half years of the final seven-year tribulation, but will be raptured at the midpoint so that we will not be on earth during the second half of the tribulation where God pours out his great wrath. And then fourth, we have the pre-wrath view that the church will be raptured after the midpoint of the tribulation, but just before God pours out his great wrath upon the earth. Many who hold this view define that point as being when Christ opens the sixth seal in Revelation 6, but there is not universal agreement on that point. So, which view is correct? Well, we don't have to guess. Scripture clearly tells us which view is correct, which brings us 
to agenda topic number two. Three irrefutable proofs of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Scripture isn't vague on the timing of the rapture. It doesn't tell us the specific year or day it will occur, but in terms of its timing relative to the seven-year tribulation, Scripture is very clear. So, let me give you three proofs of a pre-tribulation rapture that do not use undefined terms because Scripture defines the terms clearly for us. Here are three irrefutable proofs of the pre-trib rapture of the church. Proof number one. Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the 24 elders, reveals the raptured, resurrected church in heaven before the tribulation starts. Not only does this reveal that the church is in heaven before the tribulation begins, but that they already have eternal resurrected bodies and that the judgment seat of Christ, where the saints in the church will get their rewards, has already happened. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, who are the 24 elders? Over the centuries, there has been much debate over who the 24 elders are in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. There are four main views as to their identity. Some say they are elders of the church. Others say they are elders of Israel. Others say they are a combination of the 12 patriarchs of Israel plus the 12 apostles. And still others say they are angels. I'm going to show you that these 24 elders are in fact representatives of the entire church, which has already been raptured and is in heaven before the tribulation starts. None of the elders are from Old Testament Israel and none of them are angels. Let's now prove that using scripture. First, let's read through the relevant passages in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. In Revelation 4, John is immediately caught up to heaven, hearing a voice that sounded like a trumpet. There's that trumpet-sounding voice of God. The last trump that triggers the rapture may not be a trumpet at all. It may be simply the voice of God. John wrote, After this I, John, looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now, the fact that John heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet and was told to come up hither is not irrefutable evidence of a pre-trib rapture, but when you combine it with the irrefutable evidence of the 24 elders, you can see that it very well can be a picture of the pre-trib rapture. But we don't even need to go there. Let's just stick with the 24 elders. In this passage, John was taken directly into the throne room of God in heaven. Around the throne were 24 elders who were also seated, wearing white robes and with crowns on their heads. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. Who are these twenty-four elders? We don't have to guess. Scripture tells us exactly who these are in Revelation chapter 5, where they sing a song of praise to God for what he has done for them. Revelation chapter 5, And when he, Jesus the Lamb, had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. In this passage, we see Jesus taking the book or scroll that has seven seals on it, which he will then break off one by one in Revelation 6, releasing tribulation judgment upon the earth. This is the moment where Jesus is no longer sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. He is now standing and beginning to reign. 
Many view this scroll as the title deed of the earth, which Satan came to own after deceiving Adam, and now has been purchased back by Christ through his sacrifice on the cross. Whether that is, in fact, what the scroll is, we'll have to wait and see because Scripture doesn't tell us. But what Scripture does tell us is that when the 24 elders see Jesus take that scroll, they immediately fall down and worship. They sing a new song that has never been sung before because for the first time, Jesus has now started his reign over the earth. He's no longer waiting by the Father's side for his enemies to be made his footstool. Through these passages in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we see exactly who these 24 elders are. Specifically, we see three things about their identity. First, they sing that they were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. That can only be referring to Christians. These 24 elders are Christians. They are not angels. Angels are not redeemed by the blood of Christ. And we'll see in a minute that they are also not Israel. They're New Testament Christians. Second, they sing that they have been redeemed to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. How many kindred, tongues, peoples, and nations are there? Certainly a lot more than 24. So these 24 elders are not just singing about themselves. They are singing about a much larger group of people who have also been redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and they are saying that they are part of that group. The word elder means someone who is representing or presiding over a larger group. Their use of the words us and we indicate that they aren't the only ones. They are elders or representatives of a much larger group of people who are just like them. They are identifying themselves as being part of a much larger group. This much larger group comes from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. It's not us versus them, us here in heaven and them down there on the earth. It's just us. All of those who were redeemed, like the 24 elders, no distinction, it's not just 24 of them in heaven. It's so many that it's from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Third, let's examine their bodies and what they are wearing. Now that we know that these are Christians redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and that these 24 represent a much larger group of Christians who are just like them, let's look back at the description in chapter 4, which now makes a whole lot more sense. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne. Notice that these 24 elders, who are Christians redeemed by the blood, who represent a much larger group of Christians already with them in heaven, are clothed in white raiment and have golden crowns on their heads. First, this means that they already have their eternal bodies. They've already been resurrected. They're not spirits. They have bodies with heads upon which they wear crowns. They have arms to cast those crowns at the feet of Jesus. These elders already have their eternal bodies, something that will not happen to Christians until the resurrection. Yet, here we see resurrected Christians in eternal bodies in heaven before the tribulation starts. So, the rapture and resurrection of these Christians who represent the church in heaven has already taken place. And the breaking of the seals in chapter 6, which starts the judgments of the tribulation, hasn't even happened yet. These Christians were raptured and resurrected before the tribulation. But there's more. John says that they were clothed in white. Revelation 19, which we'll look at in a few minutes, says that white raiment represents the righteousness of the saints. 
These are Christian saints, and they have crowns of gold. Where did they get this white raiment and the golden crowns? The church doesn't get white raiment and golden crowns on earth. There's only one place where those rewards are given. We get them at the judgment seat of Christ. These 24 elders have already been given eternal resurrected bodies, which happens at the rapture, and have already been given their white raiment and golden crowns, their rewards, which happens at the judgment seat of Christ that follows the rapture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 5, Paul writes about the judgment seat of Christ. There are not multiple occurrences of this where people go through the judgment seat of Christ at different times. If one believer went through the judgment seat of Christ, then the entire church has gone through it. This means the rapture, resurrection, and judgment seat of Christ have already taken place for these Christians. They are in their eternal resurrected bodies, which happens at the rapture. They have already been rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ, and the tribulation hasn't started yet. And these 24 elders have told us that they are Christians, saved by the blood of Christ, and that they preside over and represent a much larger group of Christians who are just like them, even referring to them and identifying with them using the words us and we, who have been redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. That's irrefutable evidence of the church already in heaven in their eternal bodies before the start of the tribulation. That's not a fuzzy interpretation. It's crystal clear. But how do we know for sure that Israel or the Old Testament patriarchs or even the tribulation saints aren't among the 24 elders? The answer is that Israel, the Old Testament saints, and the tribulation saints cannot appear in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 as part of the 24 elders because they are not resurrected until the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. How do we know that? Scripture tells us in Daniel chapter 12, where an angel was speaking to Daniel. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. This passage says that there will be a time of trouble such as never was before, a period of time that we call the tribulation, the last seven years before the return of Christ. At the end of that tribulation, it says, Thy people shall be delivered. Twice the angel speaking to Daniel uses the phrase, Thy people. Which people will be delivered? He was talking about Daniel's people, the Jews. This passage in Daniel 12 isn't talking about the church, which was still an unrevealed mystery at that time. This passage is saying that Israel will be delivered after the tribulation, not before it. That's exactly what we see in Matthew 24 and Revelation 20, a post-trib resurrection of Israel. Guess what? There will be a post-trib resurrection, but it will not be for the church, which we see already in heaven in resurrected bodies in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. The post-trib resurrection will be for Old Testament saints and for tribulation saints who died before the second coming of Christ. There will be both a pre-trib rapture and a post-trib rapture. We can picture this on our timeline. First, there's the pre-trib rapture of the church. That will happen before the start of the seven-year tribulation. The church will receive resurrected eternal bodies at that time will then appear at the judgment seat of Christ, where we'll be rewarded for our works. Following that is the marriage of the Lamb, where we'll be united with Christ forever. Then comes the second coming of Christ, at which time the Old Testament and tribulation saints who have died will be resurrected. 
So yes, there will be both a pre-trib and post-trib rapture and resurrection. But the pre-trib resurrection will be for the church, and the post-trib resurrection will be for Israel and the tribulation saints who died before the second coming. Scripture shows the church, as evidenced by the 24 elders, already in heaven before the breaking of the first seal of Revelation 6. The church is in heaven before the tribulation starts. But still, some people say that the 24 elders are the 12 patriarchs of Israel from the Old Testament plus the 12 apostles. This is where I've seen a lot of really bad Bible teaching, where people will refer to Revelation 21 describing the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, and they point out how this future city has 12 gates named after the 12 patriarchs of Israel and 12 foundations named after the 12 apostles. They reason 12 plus 12 equals 24. Aha! There you have it. The 24 elders are the 12 patriarchs of Israel plus the 12 apostles. That is horrible Bible analysis using passages that make no such conclusion. Israel will not be resurrected until after the tribulation. Daniel 12 proves that. So the patriarchs of Israel cannot appear in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 in their resurrected bodies as 12 of the 24 elders. It's totally impossible. After all, what is the purpose of the tribulation? There are two reasons. To prepare Israel to accept Jesus at his second coming, and second, to punish the nations with God's wrath. When are the Jews resurrected? Not until Revelation 20 at the second coming then how can the patriarchs of Israel be shown in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 as being 12 of the 24 elders already having resurrected bodies? The answer is they can't. These 24 elders are not spirits or departed souls. They have crowns on their heads, which means they have heads. They have bodies, resurrected bodies. The resurrection for them has already happened, while for the Jews, the resurrection won't happen until the end of the tribulation. Therefore, neither the patriarchs of Israel nor anyone from the Old Testament can be members of the 24 elders shown in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, which takes place before the tribulation starts. It's impossible. Because of their disobedience, Israel will go through the entire tribulation to prepare them to receive their Messiah. It's also impossible that the tribulation saints are among the 24 elders, because in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, the tribulation hasn't started yet. The 24 elders in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are representatives of the church, which is already in heaven. We see this further confirmed in Revelation 5 by the song of the 24 elders, where they sing that Jesus has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. These 24 elders, which represent the church, are saying that they will serve as kings and priests and shall reign with Christ on the earth. Back in Revelation chapter 1, John addressed the church using those exact same words, describing what saved Christians will be doing during the millennial kingdom reign of Christ. John wrote, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and from Jesus Christ who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John isn't speaking about Israel here. He's writing about the church, how Christ has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. That's exactly the words the 24 elders sing, proving again that they are resurrected Christians, elders of the church in heaven before the tribulation starts. These 24 elders, along with all saved believers in the church, will reign and rule with Christ as kings and priests, and will start doing that before the tribulation begins. But why 24 elders? Why not 7 or 12 or some other number? 
There's one place in the Bible that gives us an answer to that, and it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, where David divided the priesthood and assigned 24 men to serve as priestly leaders and governors of the sanctuary, representing the people in the house of God. I won't read this long passage. You can stop the video if you want to see it. But it clearly shows David appointing 24 elders to represent the people in the sanctuary, exactly what we see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. In Exodus, Moses was commanded by God to build the tabernacle exactly according to specifications. In Hebrews 8 and 9, the writer tells us that the earthly tabernacle and temple were shadows of the actual temple in heaven. Just as David appointed 24 priests to serve before God in the earthly sanctuary, so we now see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 the same number of 24 elders doing that same function in the actual heavenly sanctuary, representing all saved believers in the throne room. So there you have it. Irrefutable proof number one, the 24 elders proves that the church is already in heaven before the tribulation starts, all saved by the blood of Christ, taken from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, all to reign and rule with Christ. The rapture, resurrection, and the judgment seat of Christ have already happened for them. They are in their resurrected bodies, and the tribulation seals of Revelation 6 haven't been broken yet. There's no mistaking this. There's no getting around it. There's no explaining it away. It's irrefutable. The 24 elders proves that the church is in heaven before the seven-year tribulation starts. It's irrefutable proof of the pre-trib rapture of the church. That's the first irrefutable proof of a pre-trib rapture. Here's the second. Proof number two. Revelation chapter 19, the marriage of the Lamb, shows the raptured, resurrected church prepared in heaven before the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ happens at the end of Revelation chapter 19, but before Christ returns to earth at the start of Revelation chapter 19, we see the church already in heaven at the marriage of the Lamb. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God." In this passage, we see two great events being referenced, the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper. They are not the same, and this passage calls out that they are not the same. The marriage of the Lamb takes place in heaven, while the marriage supper or celebration takes place on earth after the second coming of Christ. The marriage of the Lamb is the consummation of the marriage, while the marriage supper is the celebration where guests are invited to celebrate the marriage. In modern customs, the marriage supper would be the reception that follows the marriage ceremony. But for its significance to the timing of the rapture, there are two points to be noted. First, the marriage of Christ to the church has already been consummated in heaven. Notice the phrase, the marriage of the Lamb is come. J. Dwight Pentecost, who holds a doctorate in theology and taught at Dallas Theological Seminary, wrote about this phrase in his book, Things to Come, where on pages 226 and 227 he wrote, According to Revelation 19, verse 7, the declaration is, The marriage of the Lamb is come. The aorist tense translated is come signifies a completed act showing us that the marriage has been consummated. The place of the marriage can only be in heaven. Second, the church is shown again already there in heaven in resurrected bodies with their rewards. Notice the sentence, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. 
Here in Revelation 19, before Christ's second coming happens, we see the church already in heaven, already clothed in white linen, which happens at the judgment seat of Christ, which means the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ have already happened. This fact confirms what we just went over concerning the church already being seen in heaven in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And this again totally eliminates the post-trib position. You can't get around it. The church is again shown in heaven, having already been resurrected and rewarded before the second coming. Notice that it says the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Again, we are not saved by our righteousness, but by Christ's righteousness. Our righteousness has nothing to do with our salvation, which is by faith in Christ alone. But after we are saved as part of discipleship, we are expected to do good works that the Father has planned for us. At the judgment seat of Christ, we will be rewarded for those good works. This white linen then, which represents the righteousness of the saints, not the righteousness of Christ, but the righteousness of saints, shows that they have already been rewarded for their good works. The judgment seat of Christ has already happened, which means the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the saints has already happened. And just a word on the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is not Israel. It is the church. How do we know? John the Baptist told us. Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, verse 28, that up to that point in Israel's history, there has never been anyone greater than John the Baptist. So if Israel is the bride of Christ, then surely John the Baptist, the greatest of all Jews, would be part of that. But in John chapter 3, John the Baptist said that he was not the bride, but the friend of the bridegroom. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. John clearly said that he was not the bride, but the friend of the bridegroom. If John is not the bride, then Israel is not the bride of Christ. In Ephesians 5, Paul clearly said that the church is the bride of Christ. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And as for Revelation 21, where the bride of Christ is referred to when John is shown the new Jerusalem, that is simply a reference to where the bride lives. Christ is not marrying a city or a building. He's marrying a people that he himself has redeemed. The bride of Christ is the church. Getting back to Revelation chapter 19 and the marriage of the Lamb, whether you believe that the marriage of the Lamb takes place in heaven or on earth is irrelevant. I believe scripture teaches clearly that it takes place in heaven while the marriage supper is the millennial kingdom where we will reign and rule with Christ. But that's for another video. The point is this. In Revelation 19, the bride who is the church is in heaven and has made herself ready. Past tense, it's already happened, wearing white robes. The church is not suffering through the tribulation, waiting to get raptured at the second coming. Scripture clearly shows the church already in heaven, already dressed in white, having already been through the judgment seat of Christ, already for the marriage of the Lamb. There's no getting around it. There's no explaining it away. It's irrefutable. Scripture clearly shows the church in heaven before the second coming, already having been raptured, resurrected, rewarded, and being married to Christ. That's the second irrefutable proof of the pre-trib rapture of the church. Here's the third irrefutable proof. Proof number three, Revelation chapter nine, demon locusts. 
destroys the false claim that the church will endure the tribulation on earth, but will be supernaturally protected from God's wrath. This one I've never heard anyone talk about as being a pre-trib rapture proof, but it certainly is. Let's look at these demon locusts in Revelation chapter 9, where we first see the blowing of the fifth trumpet of God. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. These are not just locusts. These are demons who have been imprisoned in the bottomless pit and are now set free to roam about the earth. They appear to look like locusts, but they have power to inflict intense pain on people as that of a scorpion. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. These demon locusts will sting people, and their sting will be so painful that the people will wish to die, but death will elude them. There is only one group of people who will be protected from this attack those who have the seal of God in their foreheads. For it says that these demon locusts were only allowed to sting those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Who are the ones that will be protected by having a seal placed in their foreheads? There's only one group mentioned in Scripture, the 144,000 witnesses of the tribe of Israel. From Revelation chapter 7, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Notice that only the 144,000 witnesses of the tribes of Israel are sealed in their foreheads. They are the only ones protected from these demon locusts who will sting like scorpions causing intense pain for five months. No one else is sealed. Why is this a proof of a pre-trib rapture of the church? Because it shows that if the church were on earth during this time, then they will not be protected from these demon locusts. The people who believe in a post-trib rapture teach that the church will go through the entire tribulation, but will be protected from God's wrath. Clearly, if the church is on earth during this time, they will not be protected. Only the 144,000 will be sealed and protected. Scripture is crystal clear on this, even citing the exact number of people, all Jews from Israel, who will be protected. No one else will be protected. That means if the church is on earth during this time, they will not be protected. They will be stung by demon locusts and will be tormented for five months, seeking death but unable to find it. That's crazy if you think God will put his children through that. Post-trib believers try to draw a distinction between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God as if that even mattered, saying that the church won't be protected from Satan's wrath, just from God's wrath. That's crazy talk, for God uses people, kings, and even demons to deliver his wrath. That's like saying that when Old Testament Israel was taken to Babylon, it was the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar, not the wrath of God, that afflicted them. That's crazy. 
God used Nebuchadnezzar to deliver his wrath the same way God will use Satan and these demon locusts to deliver his wrath. And besides, the fifth trumpet that opens the bottomless pit and releases these locusts was instigated by God. This whole notion that the church will be on earth during the tribulation but will be protected by God is blown apart by this account of demon locusts. For scripture clearly says that no one will be protected other than the 144,000 Jewish witnesses from Israel. So if the church is on earth through this entire tribulation, we're not protected. Do you really think that God, who dearly loves his children, will allow us to be tormented for five months by demon locusts? It's not going to happen. The church is nowhere on earth when these locusts are released. If the church were on earth, then God would put a seal on our heads to protect us, just like he plans to do for the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. But scripture is very clear that only the 144,000 witnesses will be sealed. God loves his children and will not subject us to demon locusts. But aren't there tribulation saints on earth, those who come to believe in Christ during the tribulation? Won't they be protected? Maybe there are no Christian believers at the time that these locusts are released. Notice that it says the people who are stung will seek death but not find it. Why can't they find death if they seek it? Maybe, in God's mercy, he uses the torment of these locusts to wake unbelievers up to where they cry out to him to be rescued and saved. Maybe this is one of several means he uses to turn people to Christ during the tribulation so that there can be tribulation saints. We talk about the seven-year tribulation as being a time of God's wrath, but it is also a time of God's mercy. For if he just wanted to kill unbelievers, he could do that in an instant, not take seven years to do it. Maybe in his mercy, he's allowing people to experience these horrible destructions and sufferings to give them one last chance to repent and be saved. Maybe this causes a revival. We don't know for sure. But what we do know is that Scripture is crystal clear on there being only 144,000 Jewish witnesses who are protected from these demon locusts. So if the church is on earth, we will not be protected. God would never let that happen. The only answer is that the church is not on earth when these demon locusts are released. That's irrefutable proof number three, demon locusts. You can't deny this or explain it away. It's undeniable proof that the church is not on earth until the second coming. That's because the church is already raptured, already in heaven, when this happens. The pre-trib rapture of the church is a fact proven by scripture. There you have it. That's three irrefutable proofs of a pre-trib rapture. The 24 elders the marriage of the lamb, and demon locusts. I could go on. For example, if the church is not raptured until the second coming, then there will be no one left to populate the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom on earth will be populated by flesh and blood people. If all the Christians are resurrected at the second coming, as taught by post-trib believers, and all unbelievers who survive the tribulation are removed when Christ judges the nations, then there's no one left to populate the millennial kingdom under the post-trib view. I could make that a fourth proof of the pre-trib rapture. No one to populate the millennial kingdom if the church is on earth till the second coming. There are lots of other arguments from scripture supporting a pre-trib rapture, but three or even four here are enough to show that scripture irrefutably supports the pre-trib rapture of the church, just as God promised when he said in Revelation chapter 3, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. God didn't promise just to protect us through the temptations and tribulation coming on this world. He said he would keep us from the very hour of that temptation. 
the church will not be here on earth to see that hour. But still, I know some won't accept it. They'll still point to another part of the Bible and say, well, over there it says differently. The problem with that is you cannot do that with Scripture. The Bible is the Word of God, which means there cannot be even one contradiction in it. God doesn't clearly say something in one place and then say the opposite someplace else. If he did, then you've got a bigger problem than just the timing of the rapture. For if God's word contradicts itself, then that means it has errors in it, and it is therefore not perfect. If God's word is not perfect, then you can't trust any of it. God's word can't contradict itself. So if you're going to point to some other part of the Bible to try and prove that a preacher rapture won't happen, then you've also got to disprove the proofs I've laid out here, for there can be no contradictions in the word of God. But to be fair, let's briefly look at some of the opposing arguments. Let me touch on just four of the main objections to pre-trib and I'll do this briefly. Topic number three, four objections to pre-trib. First one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the go-to chapter for those who believe in post-trib. They say it shows that the rapture won't happen until after the man of sin is revealed and after he desecrates the rebuilt temple at the midpoint of the tribulation, which means the church is here on earth during the tribulation. Here's the passage. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This phrase, our gathering together unto him, is a clear reference to the rapture. Many post-trib believers point to this along with the phrase that follows, which says, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. That will happen during the tribulation. So the implication is that the church, therefore, must be on earth during the tribulation, since our gathering together unto him, the rapture, won't happen until these tribulation events occur. The problem with this logic is that the sentence structure doesn't support that conclusion. Specifically, the phrase, for that day shall not come, does not point back to the phrase, our gathering together unto him. Instead, the phrase, for that day shall not come, points to the phrase immediately before it, which says the day of Christ is at hand. That's the day that shall not come until those signs appear, the day of Christ. Paul is not talking about the day of the rapture. He's talking about the day of Christ, saying that day, the day of Christ, will not happen until all these tribulation signs occur. I'm showing the King James Version, which says the day of Christ. Most every other version will say the day of the Lord. It's a clear reference not to the rapture, but to the second coming of Christ, along with all of the tribulation that will come upon the earth. Paul is saying the second coming of Christ will not occur until these tribulation events occur first. There's no implication that the rapture are gathering together unto him must wait until Christ's return at the end of the tribulation. Paul is just saying for that day, the day of Christ's second coming will not occur until those tribulation signs are fulfilled. The Christians in that church were terrified that they had missed the rapture and that the second coming of Christ is at hand. In other words, it's about to come down on them with all the destruction, darkness, and judgment that entails. They were terrified that they would have to go through all that. But Paul comforted them, saying, No, that, that the day of Christ's second coming won't happen until all these signs take place which hadn't occurred yet. 
Paul said, let none of you be shaken in mind or be troubled. He was trying to comfort them. It wouldn't be a comfort if he then told them that they would, in fact, be going through that terrible tribulation. That would terrify them even more. Paul wasn't talking about the rapture not occurring until these signs are fulfilled. He was talking about the second coming not occurring until the signs are fulfilled. He was comforting them by telling them that they were nowhere near the second coming. This passage is actually saying the opposite of what post-trib supporters believe. The second argument against the pre-trib position is that of John 6, where Jesus references the last day. A lot of people don't believe in a pre-trib rapture of the church because of this phrase in John 6, where Jesus said, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Post-trib believers often cite this as proof that the church will not be raptured until the last day, which they say means the last day of the tribulation when Christ returns at the second coming. They also say that this means there's only one day, referring to a single 24-hour day where saints will be raptured at Christ's return. Well, two things concerning this phrase, the last day. First, from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, where Peter wrote, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In fact, we see this being true with this phrase, the last day. For in John chapter 12, Jesus used the term again when he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth them. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. This is talking about the final judgment of an unbeliever. Judgment will certainly happen at the end of the tribulation when Christ separates the sheep from the goats in Matthew 25, but that judgment is only for those who are still alive at the end of the tribulation. In John chapter 12, Jesus is speaking about judgment against everyone who does not receive his word, saying that judgment will happen in the last day. That final judgment will only happen for everyone at the great white throne judgment that occurs after Christ's millennial kingdom reign on earth. Therefore, we have the phrase, the last day, stretching over a thousand years. This is not a phrase that disproves the pre-trib rapture position. The third argument against the pre-trib position is that many say only two resurrections are in Scripture. Most post-trib supporters cite that only two resurrections are mentioned in Scripture, the first resurrection and the second resurrection. They say that there are not three, four, five, or more resurrections mentioned, only two. No other resurrections are mentioned, and both of these are referenced in Revelation chapter 20, which occurs after the second coming of Christ. Therefore, they argue the church must go through the tribulation, and the first resurrection will happen in one day, the day Christ's return. They are correct in saying that there are only two resurrections, but the term first resurrection and second resurrection do not refer to a count of the number of times resurrection happens. It refers to the type of resurrection, and there are only two types, a resurrection unto life and a resurrection unto death. In fact, the first resurrection happens at least four times. Let's prove it. First, we can look at Jesus, who is described as the first fruit of the first resurrection from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit after they that are Christ at his coming. If Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, then he is part of that first harvest, that first resurrection. That's one. Second, I've already shown you three irrefutable proofs that the church is not on earth during the tribulation. The resurrection of the church happens at the pre-trib rapture, when Christ comes for his bride. The third time the resurrection unto life happens is at the second coming of Christ, when the Old Testament and tribulation saints who have already passed away are resurrected. 
This is shown in Revelation chapter 20 and Daniel chapter 12. And then there's the fourth time the first resurrection happens at the very end of the millennial kingdom. Scripture does not specifically say that this will occur, but it absolutely has to occur with 100% certainty. Why? Because the millennial kingdom on earth will be populated by humans in flesh and bone mortal bodies. What's going to happen to those mortals when Christ's 1,000 year reign on earth comes to an end? Scripture clearly says that flesh and bone cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, they will also have to be resurrected into eternal bodies that are suitable for the kingdom of God. This means at least one resurrection has to occur for the people who populate the millennial kingdom. And it may be more than once. It may be that people who die during the millennium will get resurrected bodies immediately. We don't know. But for sure, there has to be a resurrection unto life for those who live all the way to the end of the millennium. So there are at least four occurrences of the first resurrection. And there's one occurrence of the second resurrection, the resurrection unto death that occurs at the great white throne judgment. This argument that the rapture must be post-trib because there are only two resurrections falls flat and is without merit. And then the fourth argument against pre-trib is that of Matthew 24, which I contend does not have the rapture of the church in it at all. There are two passages in Matthew 24 that post-trib believers typically cite to prove that the church is not raptured until the second coming. The first is Christ's calling of his elect. Matthew 24 uh, verses 30 through 31 and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. The fatal flaw here for post-trib believers is their assumption that the phrase, his elect, means the church. Therefore, this means the rapture of the church occurs at the second coming. But Jesus wasn't speaking to the church. He was speaking to Jews. And while the New Testament writers later refer to the church as God's elect, the church itself didn't exist when Jesus said the words. The church was still a mystery. He wasn't talking about gathering his church. The Jews at that time, however, who heard him say these words, knew exactly what he was saying. The Old Testament clearly references the elect as being Israel. For example, in Isaiah 45, it says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Jesus wasn't referring to the regathering of the church, which didn't exist at that time. This is the regathering of Israel as foretold in Isaiah 27. In that day, the Lord will start his threshing from the flowing stream of the Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered up one by one, O sons of Israel. It will come about also in that day that a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Notice that there's even a trumpet blown at the regathering of Israel, just like it says in Matthew 24. This is not the church being regathered as Christ's elect, it's about Israel which the Old Testament also refers to as God's elect. This fits with Daniel 12 that we looked at earlier, which says Israel will be raised at the end of the tribulation. The second passage in Matthew 24 used by post-trib believers is about those who are taken in what sounds like the rapture. Matthew 24 verses 37 through 41, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. I've done a video on Matthew 24 and I'll include a link to it at the end of this video. This passage is not referring to the rapture. The rapture of the church is nowhere in Matthew 24. It says that it will be like the days of Noah, where they knew not until the flood waters came and took them away. Those who were taken away by the flood waters were taken to their deaths in judgment. They were removed from the earth. This passage in Matthew 24 is talking about unbelievers who survived the tribulation being taken away and put to death, just like the people of Noah's day were taken away by flood waters. They will not be allowed to enter Christ's 1,000 year kingdom reign on earth. We also see this clearly in the parallel passage in Luke chapter 17. Two men shall be in a field, the one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. They're going to be taken to where the dead bodies are, to where the birds are gathered that will feed on them. This is not the rapture of the church. He's talking about dead bodies, about unbelievers being taken and put to death. The rapture of the church is nowhere in Matthew 24. These are just some of the arguments against the pre-trib position. I only provide them to illustrate that they all can easily be interpreted to support the pre-trib rapture of the church. Lastly, let's examine topic number four, the story of Noah, a picture of pre-tribulation rapture. People on the pre-trib side have done a terrible job of trying to use Noah as an example that foreshadows a pre-trib rapture. The story of Noah is indeed an Old Testament picture of the pre-trib rapture, but nearly everyone I've seen who tries to explain it gets the symbolism wrong. They'll typically say that Noah being lifted up in the water is a picture of the New Testament church being lifted up in the rapture. Noah was not on earth when God's judgments fell, as the church will not be on earth during the tribulation. Genesis chapter 7, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. A post-trib person will hear that and rightly say, wait a minute, Noah wasn't taken to heaven. He was protected by God through the flood. He stayed on earth during the judgment and experienced the flood. If anything, the story of Noah proves a post-trib position, teaching that the church will remain on earth, go through the tribulation, and see all of God's wrath being poured out. But like Noah, the church will be protected by God through the tribulation. The problem with this bad analogy of using the story of Noah is that the symbolism is wrong. Specifically, it leaves out one important character, Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, right before the story of Noah, we read this, And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then in Hebrews 11, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Noah is not a picture of the church. Enoch is. Enoch pleased God and God took him in a rapture. Enoch never tasted death. God removed him from the earth before the wickedness and tribulation of Noah's time overtook the world. Enoch is a symbol of the church being taken in a pre-trib rapture. Just like Enoch, believers in Christ please God, and God will take them off the earth before the tribulation comes with all the wickedness that will exist during that period of time. Enoch is the symbol of the church. After Enoch was taken came all the wickedness and tribulation. Enoch wasn't there to see it. Noah was. Noah is a symbol of Israel, going through the tribulation, but being protected supernaturally by God. It all fits. 
So that's it on the pre-trib rapture of the church. I've shown you a short introduction to the rapture, three irrefutable proofs of the pre-trib rapture of the church, how key arguments against pre-trib can be easily interpreted differently to support pre-trib, and how the story of Enoch and Noah reveal an Old Testament foreshadowing of the pre-trib rapture. Christ's return for his bride, the church, can happen at any moment. The church will not go through the tribulation. But the more important question is, will you be taken in the rapture or left behind? That's the only question that matters. Not one single Christian who is saved by the blood of Christ will miss the rapture. I did a video proving this. I'll include a link to it at the end of this video. Everyone who places their faith in Christ will be raptured before the final tribulation starts. Jesus said in John chapter 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. There's one and only one way to ensure that you are taken in the rapture. Believe in Jesus. To the one who believes in him, Jesus promises that they already have everlasting life, that they shall not come into condemnation, and that they have already passed from death to life. God is not waiting until the end of our lives to see if we're good enough Christians to be saved. On the contrary, Jesus said in John chapter 6, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The one who believes is already saved, guaranteed, and God won't change his mind no matter what. We have eternal security in Christ. The only question then is, have you taken that step of placing your faith in Christ, believing that he died on the cross to pay for every one of your sins before a perfectly holy God, and then rose from the dead to give you eternal life? Can you look at a point in your life where you took that step of faith and decided to trust Him alone to save you? But what if you're not sure you're even saved? Then take the first step by believing in Christ. Choose today to believe in Christ to save you, believing that He died on the cross to pay for all of your sins and rose from the dead to give you eternal life, and that He will not only save you but will keep you saved forever. Whatever you may have done, and no matter how badly you may have blown it in the past, don't think for a second that God has given up on you. The Lord's desire is to save you. He is for you, not against you. 2 Peter chapter 3, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is not the Lord's desire that even one person should perish. It is not too late. If you think that, that's just the enemy talking, trying to get you to give up on God. Don't give in to that negative thought. God is for you, not against you, and He desires you with an everlasting love. He longs to pour out blessing upon you. Let Him. So, if you're not 100% sure of your salvation, my closing wish for you is this. Make sure you are saved right now. Don't put it off. So believe on Him and let Him set you free. Salvation equals God's grace alone through faith alone on Christ alone. Believing the gospel means placing your entire trust on Christ for your salvation. Believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose from the dead, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Nothing more, nothing less. There are no other requirements to be saved than to believe on Jesus. Once you place your faith in Christ for your salvation, you are born again, and you are forever a child of God. Our Father is a good Father, who will never abandon you, but will preserve you in the faith and never let you go. If you are not certain about your salvation, time is getting very late. Don't take the chance of missing out on God. Making sure you are saved is as easy as ABC. Admit to God that you have sinned. Believe that Jesus, God's Son, died to pay for your sins 100%, was buried, and rose again. Call upon Jesus and ask Him to forgive you and save you. If you make that decision to call upon Him, God gives you this assurance. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. Thank you for watching.